In this video, we're going to examine the matrix of material properties of linear elastic materials. To describe a linear elastic materials, I need coefficients that relate the values of the stresses to the values of the strains. So, for example, to find the component of the stress sigma on 1 as a function of the strain components, I will need 9 coefficients c1111, c1112, c1113, and so on. And so the stress component sigma on 1 would be equal to the first constant multiplied by epsilon 11, the second constant multiplied by epsilon 12, and so on. So I will need 9 constant multiplied by the strain matrix components. Similarly, for the stress component sigma 2, 1, I will need 9 different components to relate that component of the stress to the 9 components of the strain, and so on. And because I have 9 components of the stress and 9 components for the strain, I will need 81 constants in general to describe the relationship between a 9 by 9 matrix with another 9 by 9 matrix. Fortunately, we can reduce those number of constants because we know some things about the stress and the strain. And the first type of reduction is because we know that both the stress and the strain are symmetric. So we can think of the stress as having six independent components rather than nine, sigma on one, sigma two two, sigma three three, sigma one two, sigma one three, and sigma two three. The stress by definition is a matrix, but we're going to look at the six components as six independent components of a vector representation of the stress. Similarly, the strain is made out of an, uh, a 3 by 3 symmetric matrix, so we're going to extract six components of the strain, the six independent components of the strain, and we're going to look at the strain, a vector representation for the strain. And in this vector representation, we're going to multiply epsilon 1, 2, epsilon 1, 3, and epsilon 2, 3 by the value of 2, which gives us the engineering shear strains. So now, instead of 81 constants, we only need 36 constants to describe the relationship between the six components of the stress with the six components of the strain. Next, we're going to try to reduce the number of constants by considering that this material is elastic, which means it preserves the energy. Saying that the material is the elastic means that there's an energy that can be stored in the material when it's loaded, and this energy is fully recoverable when the loading is removed. Mathematically speaking, this implies that the stress component Ij is obtained by taking the derivative of that energy function with respect to epsilon ij. Because of the existence of this energy, because we're saying this energy that's independent of the path exists as a function, we can show that this implies the matrix relationship between the stress and the strain has to be symmetric. How can we show this? First, we remember that the component sigma ij is equal to nine components multiplied by the corresponding strain value, so nine constants each multiplied by the corresponding strain value, then that component Cijkl will be equal to partial sigma Ij by partial epsilon Kl, which is equal to the second derivative of that energy with respect to epsilon Ij and epsilon Kl. From this relationship, and knowing that the second derivative of U with respect to partial epsilon Ij, partial epsilon Kl, will be equal to the second derivative of u with respect to epsilon kl, epsilon ij. This implies that c ij kl will be equal to c kl ij. And so we can reduce the constants from 36 to 21 unknown constants. So for a linear elastic material that preserves energy, the relationship between the stress and the strain can be defined using 21 
constants. These are the 21 constants that I need to define the relationship. We are now going to try to reduce those number of constants by considering specific type of linear elastic material. The first type is the orthotropic linear elastic materials. For orthotropic materials, because the response is symmetric around specific planes, around those planes, the stress sigma on one is not going to be related to the shear strains. And so you can see that I can consider a lot of zeros in that matrix of relationship between the stresses and the strain because I'm assuming a symmetric response around particular planes. These are the planes of orthotropy. So for orthotropic linear elastic materials, instead of needing 21 constants, I only need nine constants. It is very important to note that the relationship between the stress and the strain for orthotropic linear elastic materials is valid only for a particular coordinate system. So this relationship is tied to the particular coordinate system. If I change the coordinate system, I will need to change those numbers according to the new coordinate system. We can choose nine physical constants that describe the relationship between the stress and the strain in orthotropic linear elastic materials. We can assume that epsilon 1 1 is equal to sigma 1 1 over Young's modulus E 1 1 minus Poisson's ratio 2 1 multiplied by sigma 2 2 over E 2 2 minus Poisson's ratio 3 1 sigma 3 3 over E 3 3 and so on and the shear strains to epsilon 1 2 which is the shear strain gamma, the engineering shear strain gamma on two, it's equal to sigma on two divided by the shear modulus G on two. So when you count these, and when you consider that the stress matrix is symmetric, which means that this value is equal to this value, and that value is equal to that value, and this value is equal to this value, you count the number of independent unknowns, you'll find that they are nine. So for a linear elastic orthotropic material, I need nine constants to fully define the relationship. These constants can be defined as false. EII, B11, E22, or E33, is the ratio of the uniaxial stress to the uniaxial strain in the direction of the basis vector EI. As long as those, EI, E1, E2, and E3 are the directions of orthotropy of the material. Under a uniaxial stress sigma on 1, the strain epsilon on 1 is equal to sigma on 1 over E11. In that case, epsilon 2, 2 is equal to negative Poisson's ratio 1, 2, sigma on 1 over E11. And so this Poisson's ratio nu 1, 2 is equal to negative E22 divided by epsilon 1, 1. And so Poisson's ratio Ij is equal to the negative the ratio between the axial strain in the direction of, of the basis vector Ej to the axial strain in the direction of the basis vector Ei when the material is uniaxially stressed in the direction of the basis vector Ei. Gij is the ratio between the shear stress sigma ij to the engineering shear strain gamma ij. If instead of having orthotropic material, we have a transversely isotropic material, which is a material that acts as an isotropic material in one plane, in the direction perpendicular to that, the material response is symmetric, then we can reduce the number of constants needed to define the relationship between the stress and the strain for this material. In fact, we can reduce the number from nine to five constants. And if here we assume that the plane of isotropy is the plane made out of E1 and E2, in that case, you see that the relationship between sigma on one and epsilon on one is defined by this constant C. 1, 1, 1, 1, because in the direction of the basis vector, the second basis vector, we're assuming that it's also in the plane of the isotropy, we also have the same constant. 
And so when you count the number of independent constants here, you're going to find only five. Again, similar to the orthotropic material, this matrix of properties is valid only in the coordinate system that is aligned such that E1 and E2 are the plane of isotropy. We can choose the five constants with specific physical meaning to describe the relationship between the stress and the strain in transversely isotropic linear elastic materials. Young's Mollius and Poisson's ratio E and nu describe the response in the plane of isotropy. E33 describes the ratio between the axial stress to the axial strain perpendicular to the plane of isotropy. Poisson's ratio 31 describes the ratio between the strain in the plane of isotropy to the strain in the opposite direction. And G13 describes the shear strain or the relationship between the shear stress and the shear strain when shearing is out of the plane of isotropy. And so the relationship is described by saying epsilon on one is equal to sigma on one over E minus Poisson's ratio sigma to two over E. And you can see that this is similar to isotropic materials, but because the third direction is the direction of different response, we get a different Poisson's ratio and sigma 33 divided by E33. And so on, epsilon to two is equal to negative Poisson's ratio sigma on one over E plus sigma to two over E minus Poisson's ratio three one sigma three three divided by E three three and so on. So you get this relationship between the strain and the stresses, which can be expressed in matrix form like that. And you can see that for epsilon one one and epsilon two two, the first two terms look like linear elastic materials and even the shear stress or the shear strain to the shear stress sigma on two epsilon one two are related using E and Poisson's ratio similar to isotropic materials. Outside whenever we're looking at three, so whenever the, the third plane is involved, we get new material constants and when you look at the number of independent constants here, you will find that we have five independent constants, taking into consideration that this matrix has to be symmetric. The five constants are defined as follows. E is the ratio of the uniaxial stress to uniaxial strain in any direction in the plane of isotropy. The Poisson's ratio nu is the negative of the ratio between the transverse strain to the axial strain when the material is uniaxially stressed in any direction in the isotropy plane. Outside of the isotropy plane, E33 is the ratio of the uniaxial stress to uniaxial strain in the direction perpendicular to the isotropy plane. Poisson's ratio 1,3 gives me the relationship or negative the ratio between the axial strain epsilon 3,3 to the axial strain epsilon 1,1 one, one, when the material is stressed uniaxially in the direction of E1. G13 is the ratio between the shear stress sigma 1 through to the engineering shear strain gamma 1 3 in the plane defined by the directions of E1 and E3. I can further reduce the number of constants from 5 for linear elastic isotropic materials. In fact, for isotropic linear elastic materials, the number of unknowns needed to describe the relationship is only two constants. The relationship between the stress and the strain for isotropic linear elastic materials is independent of the coordinate system. If I know those two constants, then I know this matrix and I can use this matrix in any coordinate system. So if I change the coordinate system, I can basically still use the same matrix. The two constants that I traditionally work with are Young's Mollius and Poisson's ratio. The relationship between the stress and the strain using those two constants for isotropic linear elastic materials can either be described as the strains in terms of the stresses or the stresses in terms of the strain. These two matrices are the inverse of each other. They are only function of two constants E and Poisson's ratio. And you remember the relationship G which is the shear modulus, is actually a function of E and Young's modulus. 
So if I know E and Poisson's ratio, then I know fully the relationship between the stress and the strain. There are different or alternative material constants that can also be used instead of E and Poisson's ratio. These are the shear modulus, the bulk modulus, and Lemmy's constants. So we're going to study each of them to see why they're important or where they came from. The shear modulus, G, we know that's equal to E divided by 2, 2 1 plus Poisson's ratio. But let's now see where this relationship came from. If I have a cube of the material under shear stress sigma 1, 2, the shear strain in that situation is equal to epsilon 1, 2, epsilon 1, 2. The relationship between the shear stress and the shear strain is given by 2 epsilon 1, 2 or 2 epsilon 2, 1 is equal to the shear stress divided by G. I will now look at the same cube using a different coordinate system, a coordinate system that's oriented 45 degrees from the original coordinate system. In that new coordinate system, sigma prime is equal to Q sigma Q transpose, epsilon prime is equal to Q epsilon Q transpose. When I multiply this Q by these stresses and strains, I get this new matrix, and I will call the first component sigma prime 1, 1, this component sigma prime 2, 2, this component epsilon prime 1, 1, this component epsilon prime 2, 2. For linear elastic isotropic materials, the relationship between the stress and the strain is independent of the coordinate system. So epsilon prime 1, 1 and epsilon prime 2, 2 are related to sigma prime 1, 1 and sigma prime 2, 2 using the same relationship. So epsilon prime 1, 1 is equal to sigma prime 1, 1 over E minus Poisson's ratio sigma prime to 2 over E. But I know that sigma prime 1, 1 is equal to sigma 1, 2. Sigma prime to 2 is equal to negative sigma 1, 2. So I can replace them in the right hand side of the equation. And on the left hand side of the equation, I know that epsilon prime 1, 1 is equal to epsilon 1, 2. And so I end up with the relationship that epsilon 1, 2 is equal to sigma 1, 2 over E multiplied by 1 plus Poisson's ratio. I also know that in the original coordinate system, I had this relationship between sigma 1, 2 and epsilon 2 using the shear modulus. Now I have this new relationship between epsilon 1, 2 and sigma 1, 2 using E and Poisson's ratio. So using those two relationships, I can find the relationship between G, E and Poisson's ratio. The bulk modulus is equal to E divided by 3, 1 minus 2 Poisson's ratio. The bulk modulus formula can be deduced by considering a block of material under hydrostatic state of stress. In this case, epsilon on 1 is equal to epsilon 2, 2 is equal to epsilon 3, 3 is equal to P over E minus Poisson's ratio P over E minus Poisson's ratio P over E, which is equal to 1 minus 2 Poisson's ratio P over E. The volumetric strain that we studied in the strain chapter is equal to the sum of the three axial strain components. By summing those three components, I get 3 multiplied by 1 minus 2 Poisson's ratio P over E. And so the hydrostatic stress in that case is equal to E divided by 3, 1 minus 2 Poisson's ratio multiplied by the volumetric strain, which is the sum of the three axial strain components. K is the slope of that relationship. It's the slope of the relationship between the hydrostatic stress and the volumetric strain. So it's equal to E divided by 3, 1 minus 2 Poisson's ratio. Lemmy's constants are two constants that are introduced to simplify the relationship between the stress and the strain. If I replace E Poisson's ratio divided by 1 plus Poisson's ratio, 1 minus 2 Poisson's ratio with lambda, and E divided by 2, 1 plus Poisson's ratio, I replace it with G or mu. It simplifies the relationship and then it looks very simple when I relate the stresses to the strain.